Uh, good morning. I want to bring greetings from uh, Shorewood Bible Church South. A few of our folks had uh, planned to be here this morning, but uh, apparently some things changed some of their plans. Um, but the folks from Shorewood Bible Church South do send their greetings. And I always find it a joy uh, to be in these meetings and be part of the program. And, uh, you know, 30 years I was just counting. Um, how long I've been saved, and 37 years. And when I got saved, I got saved into the grace message. And um, maybe didn't have quite some of the struggles that some had who, I mean, I grew up in, um, in church, but never really having any convictions about anything, didn't know what it was all about. And, uh, but when I did come to... Uh, that place in my life where I began to search and to try to find out what to believe, um, I got introduced to Old North Shore Church in the city of Chicago, used to be on Sheridan and Wilson. And that's where I began to learn the grace message. And uh, Pastor Jordan came up in 79. That's when I first got to know him. And my uh, spiritual life was... Uh, Never the same since. <laughs> Been a real joy uh, to uh, learn uh, from Pastor Jordan. And I would say the one thing that he, he did for me that totally revolutionized my understanding is to teach me that I had a book I could believe to, taught me about the Bible. And uh, that made all the difference in the world when it comes to really believing and knowing what you believe. And so I'm, I am forever grateful for that because prior to that, I knew a lot of doctrine, you know, a lot of truths, but I had no real stability because everybody was always talking about the book in your hand would have been better translated this way and would have been better translated that way. And what they did is deprive me of faith in that process. So to know you have a book you can believe is a tremendous asset. That's where the power of God's word is. It's in his word. Uh, my uh, topic is um, hold fast the danger of drifting. And my assignment was about a study of the causes and cure for departure from sound doctrine. Now, as I was reflecting on that, there's a couple of verses that come to mind, or a couple of ideas that come to mind as I thought about the danger of drifting, the departure from sound doctrine. Turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 and verse um, 24, 23 and 24. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, our worship of God, or what true worship is, is vitally affected by drifting away from sound doctrine. Paul speaks over in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3, he makes this statement, giving no offense in anything that the ministry, 
be not blamed. When you think about the danger of drifting away from sound doctrine, uh, the value of our ministry is at, at issue. I think about Matthew 7 where the Lord said, um, well, take a look there, Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils and in thy name in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Uh, and again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Paul talks about uh, sincerity and truth. What did I tell you? 1 Corinthians 3. Here in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself sh shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I want you to turn over to Second Timothy chapter 1. And in that, there's a, um, an idea there associated with the, the idea of judgment. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul says something here that made me think about those verses. In Second in, in Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Whereunto, I'm sorry, verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And the idea there is we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to have to give an account of ourselves. And so our, min our ministry, our service, our worship of God, all is in jeopardy uh, with regards to the, the drifting away from sound doctrine. Um, there are several causes for, for departure from sound doctrine. And I want to look at a couple of those with you. One, there's a positive effort to deceive the believer. Uh, we don't live in a vacuum. Um, when we got saved, we passed from death unto life, but we, we were moved from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And we were involved in a conflict in that process. But we have, an, we have an adversary. And his objective is to undermine, to subvert everything that God is seeking to work out, work out in us and through us. Okay? God has a design. God has a purpose for you and I. I'm thinking about John's message last night about God's purpose for populating the heavenly places. 
and so forth, and it's all about God's glory. Well, there's an adversary who seeks to undermine all of that. And that's Satan. And, that's, and, and, and what Satan wants is the very thing that God has. You remember in, um, well, look at Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. In Christ's temptation... In verse 8, the particular one I want to draw your attention to, what Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ with, in verse 8 he says, in verse 8, again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now that's what Satan wants. He wants that which belongs exclusively to God. That's worship. That's glory. Satan wants that. When you became a child of God, well, God's purpose in you is to glorify him. Satan wants to undermine that in every way he can. Over in Isaiah, you remember, he says, I will be like the most high God. And so there's that positive effort to deceive the believer. Now, Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And so this departure from the faith, this departure from sound doctrine was something that was very, Paul was very aware of and spoke about often in his writings. And the departure from sound doctrine, the departure from the faith was... um, we were forewarned about it. Uh, we were foretold that that time was coming, that day was coming. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul writes, he says, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Some shall... So we, you know... it. it it ought not to be a strange thing that, that that potential danger exists. I sometimes wonder if Christians, or those who profess to be Christians, even really believe that such a danger exists. That there is a, a definite uh, agenda by Satan to deceive. Because most pe- people today just believe that, you know, any ministry is a good ministry. And it's not. And we have been forewarned that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. And so you have that positive effort out there working to deceive the believer. But now, the the verse goes on to say... The way the departure comes, it says, giving heed, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what that says to me is that there's a listening and a devoting of attention to people and things that we ought not. Okay? Okay. In 2 Timothy 3, in verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 13. 
not everyone that parades as a minister of God, as a minister of Christ, as a preacher, or as a teacher, is to be listened to. There are some evil men and there are some, ducer, some seducers in the world. Paul refers to them as evil men and seducers. And he says they shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. Again, there's a positive effort to deceive the believer. Look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30, Paul and his departure from Ephesus, not expecting to get back that way anymore, called all the elders together and have an opportunity to say some final things to them. In verse 28, he says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flocks, and that's a danger from without. But he goes on to say, also of your own selves shall men arise, and that's the danger from within. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things with the goal to do what? To draw away disciples after themselves. First Corinthians chapter four. First Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen and sixteen. So you have that you you, you you talk about the the danger of drifting, the causes rather, the causes for departing departing from the faith, where there's a positive force out there, there's a positive policy or a program out there working to deceive you, working to snare you, working to trap you, working to undermine everything that God is seeking to, to, to achieve in your life out there. And when you give heed to it, when you pay attention to it, it's not just listening. I, I was thinking about that, you know, the, you know, the, 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 uh, it says the Thessalonians were more noble than those that were in Thessalonica and that they received the word of God with all what? Readiness of mind. But what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not those things were so. You know, there's a, a sense in which you do, you know, when, you, know you, you do listen. You, you do have to hear. But there's, some, there's something that gives guidance, that give. Um, now, if you're, you know, if you're in a searching stage where you're going to be, you're trying to evaluate the things you're hearing, if you don't know the truth. I used to say, why do people uh, go around from church to church? And they tell you, well, I'm searching for the truth. Well, the reason they continue to do that is because they don't know the truth. If you knew the truth, it would be an easy thing. You wouldn't have to go around from church to church trying to figure out which one is the right one. Because if you knew the truth, it would eliminate <laughs> the majority of them out there that you're, you're looking at. But the reason you have that search it's because people in general generally don't know what they're looking for. 
It's kind of hard to find something you don't, you don't know how to identify. Well, one of the reasons people are, are given to listening and hearing, and listening and hearing in a way that results in their actually trying, you know, uh, subjecting themselves, submitting themselves to what they're hearing. It's because they don't know the measure or they don't know what the standard of truth is. And so you have that, that uh, problem of, you know, going from place to place and getting caught up in things that you, you tend to regret <laughs> sometime later on. In 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 4, 15, Paul says, For though ye have, what? 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you, what? Not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, that, there's a lot said in that verse in, in the light of, of my topic here that is very instructive. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. If you look over at, uh, keep your place there in chapter 4, but if you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says this, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Are, ye, are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are what? Are ye in the Lord. Now, when, he, when Paul says that, and he writes here, and he says, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, for I have begotten you through the gospel. In other words, the, pe the person responsible for the salvation of the saints at Corinth was Paul. But it, it's a little bit more significant than that. Um, thinking about sound doctrine, and you know, we we talk we talk about all the Bible being the Word of God, but the Word of God has to be rightly divided. All the word of God is truth, but it's not all truth for you. Um, and so you have to rightly divide the word of truth. But when you talk about doctrine, the doctrine of the Lord, the law that God gave to Moses was doctrine. Well, the dispensation of the grace of God given to Paul, doctrine, the doctrine of the Lord. But those are, those are contrasting doctrine. They're not the same doctrine. And so at some point you might say um, the doctrine of the, you know, the, the law given to Moses becomes um, Bible doctrine, but it's not sound doctrine because we speak of sound doctrine as being truth for today. And so when we, we, we talk about when Paul talks about, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, for I have begotten you through the gospel. Sound doctrine for today begins with the revelation that God gave to Paul. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, Gentile, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given me to you were. Now, that revelation that God gives to Paul becomes the sound doctrine for us today. That's where it begins. It begins with the conversion of Paul, God raising up the apostle Paul, making him the apostle uh, to the Gentiles, making him the apostle to the world. And that doctrine becomes the doctrine that the world is to believe that the world is to, 
Go to Romans 16. Keep your place there in 1 Corinthians. We'll be back. But in Romans chapter 16, Twenty-five. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets and then he asked, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to who? All nations. For what? For the obedience of faith. So God determines who we should be listening to, is my point. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. Paul says, I have begotten you through the gospel. So in verse 16, he, he goes on to say there, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye what? Followers of me. Now, much of the problem in Christendom today is due to the failure to follow Paul. And it stems from the the idea or from the fact that they do not acknowledge Paul's unique and distinctive apostleship. They just simply see Paul as just another apostle. A great one, yes, but just simply still, yet just another apostle. So much so that uh, in all honesty, you find them listening to other men of God in scriptures more readily than they are listening to Paul. With, with regards to the doctrine of the Lord for today. Again, God gives to Paul the revelation that, that governs the dispensation of the grace of God. Uh, when we talk about a dispensation, by the way, we uh, talk about house law, the law of the household. And the information that God gives to Paul is to govern especially to govern the household of faith, for sure. But I think about Joseph was made head steward in Pharaoh's kingdom. And, and let me get the verse so I make sure I remember it right. Genesis 41, 40. In Genesis 41, let's start at verse 40, uh, 37. 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a man, such one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And I think about that by, by the about that statement because one of the things that Paul had to contend with throughout his ministry is the questioning of his apostleship. And he says, in, and I believe it's over in 1 Corinthians 14, when he gives this advice, he gives this advice as one, uh, one who one could be trusted, but one who also had the Spirit of God. Verse 39, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne 
will I be greater than thou. In other words, Joseph was given total control over Pharaoh's kingdom. And the only time Joseph, uh, 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 rather not Joseph, but uh, Pharaoh would uh, overrule was when Pharaoh was, uh, you know, making determinations from the position of his, his throne. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. But other than that, Pharaoh had entrusted uh, the stewardship of his kingdom to Joseph. And there was none greater than Joseph except for the one who appointed him. Okay? Well, that's what God has done in the case of Paul. He's made Paul the head steward in this dispensation. And there is none that is to ex exceed Paul in authority. That's why, again, he said, Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for I have begotten you through the gospel. Steve said it well. Anybody that's saved today, if they're saved, they got saved by Paul's gospel. Now, sometimes people don't know or appreciate that. But if they're saved, they got saved by believing Paul's gospel. But God has determined who we should be listening to, where we should be getting our instruction from, where we should be getting our directions. God has ordained Paul to be our apostle. And so we are to listen to him first and foremost. Uh, it's not to say that you can't have other teachers, but when you, when you think about the fact that Paul is our apostle um, and that if you're going to be drawn away, it's because you're listening to people who are competing with Paul's apostleship, competing with his authority. Go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Every time I read that verse, I, I think about this situation. If you're sitting in a Baptist church, and you read that verse, what's your first thought? Baptist doctrine. For you, the Baptist doctrine becomes the standard, becomes the norm of what truth is. If you're sitting in a Methodist church, you read that verse, what, is your, what, are, your, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts? Paul is saying there, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you... Well, if you're sitting in a Methodist church, what doctrine did you learn? Methods. You're sitting in a Baptist church, what doctrine did you learn? Pentecostal, what doctrine did you learn? You know. Well, that's not what Paul is saying. <laughs> now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Now, hold your, play, hold, hold your place there. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 4. Now, we just read in 1 Corinthians uh, 4 where Paul says, uh, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet have you not many fathers, for I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Uh, the point is clear and obvious if you're, you know, thinking when you read a verse like Romans 16, 17, that you're talking about contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, which you have heard of Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, when he, he says that to the Corinthians, 
further down in verse, uh, rather verse 16, right after he says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Then in verse 17, he goes on to say, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of what? Of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so Paul's teaching becomes the standard. God has determined who we should be. In other words, God, to hear God today is to hear Paul. To ignore Paul is to ignore God. Now you can quote all the other scriptures. You can be well versed in all the the other scriptures, but if you're not versed in Paul's doctrine, in Paul's teaching, you're not hearing God. You're not following God. In Galatians 1, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel. When you think about what defines apostasy, what's the mark of, of a true departure from the faith. It's not departing from the Baptist doctrine. It's not departing from the, you know, the Pentecostal doctrine, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Lutheran, the Catholic. It's not departing from any of the denominational churches <clears throat> or any of the 600 and so different denominations that it's, that's out there. Departing from um, the historical Christian faith really is not departing from the faith, not departing from the truth. Now, I understand, you know, when you talk about um, a set of doctrines that are designed to find a common ground or uh, uh, a common basis for identifying what Christianity is, what defines Christianity. And, you know, in, in the uh, first, second, uh, second, third, fourth century and thereafter, you know, people were trying to codify doctrine, codify a set of beliefs that would represent Christianity. But the the doctrines of what we call the historical Christian, of the Christian faith are, are not really the, the doctrines that define Christianity. Now, they are doctrines that do, you know, that, that, that are, are um, important subjects. But when you want to talk about defining that which is... Um, defines the church, defines uh, Christianity today, true Christianity, is being Pauline. You understand, when you, when you make the, the standard for apostasy, you make the standard for departing to be just departing from the historical Christian faith, that's not really defining apostasy. What's defining apostasy is departing from that revelation, that truth that God gives to Paul, that revelation that God gives. That's the measure of apostasy today in the dispensation of grace. And, and the question you have to ask yourself is not do, do you embrace the historical doctrines of the, of the church, but are you Pauline? And even that has get, gotten to the place where it needs to be ex, you know, explained thoroughly. Because sometimes people just believe that 
knowing uh, of Paul or knowing of his writing makes you Pauline or using some of his, you know, some of, or rather, some of his writing, you know, in your preaching and your teaching makes you Pauline. Well, every, everybody does because Paul is, wrote over, well, what, 13, 13 books out of what, 27 just a little, little under, little under fifty percent of the the New Testament, and it's called. Well, it's kind of hard to ignore Paul, <laughs> in that sense. And and there are people who are read and study and teach, you know, from Paul's writing, but that don't make them Pauline. Look at Isaiah 8. There are a couple of verses here just to share with you on that. Isaiah chapter 8 in verse 20. You remember when God gave the law, the law was the standard. When God gave the law to Israel, that law was the standard. And in verse 20, God sets forth the principle that is equally applicable by way of application, that is, um, same idea, different, different doctrine. But in Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in, in them. Look at Luke chapter 10. In verse 26. Luke chapter 10. And this is kind of an interesting little verse, but it, 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 it's one that when you think about how people depart from the faith, in verse 26, he said unto them, What is written in the law? And he then adds, How readest thou? You know, this debate going on about reconciliation. You know what the real problem a lot of times is how they read it. <laughs> how readest thou? And when you, t when you, when you think about uh, departing from the faith, uh, uh, for example, look over at um, 1 Timothy. How is it? Let's see. Make that 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 18. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. But, but a lot of our problem stems from, again, how we read what the scriptures say. But in any case, let me move on because my time is really getting away from me. There is that positive effort to deceive the believer. And we're not just to listen to anyone. If you're a believer, it's already been determined, it's already been defined who you, who you should be listening to, who you should be following for your, for your doctrine, for your teaching, for your instructions, and so forth. And we are to be following Paul. But it's that positive effort to deceive is what draws people away from sound doctrine. And they began to read those evil men and seducers. They began to put a spin on even Paul's teachings. You remember what Peter said? Let me just say this and then I do really have to get move on. In Second Peter chapter 3, talking about Paul's, his epistles, his writings, and in verse 16, he says, As also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, 
which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. But it is clear that Paul's epistles, Paul's writings are to be the standard. And in my text, again, if, if you look back there, he says, hold fast the form of sound words. And again, in verse 13 there, he says, which thou hast what? Heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Another cause for departure is a lack of contentment with the grace of God. Um, Paul talks about, in 2 Timothy 3, he talks about men that are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And those things are generally uncovered, again, when you talk about the evil men and what? Seducers. Again, you got this positive force working to undermine. But they, they're not just talking in a vacuum. They're not just offering you just nothing. They're seeking to draw you away. The, whole, the, the, the word seducing means to, be, to lead astray by making something seem desirable or exciting. I think I've heard Pastor Jordan define it this way, to lead from the path of right living with the promise of physical delight. Again, Christ in his temptation. Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Fall down and worship me, he says. But he's offering him something, tempting him with something. And the evil men and seducers, they come along, they're offering something. And there's and what they're offering you, if 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 it appeals to you, uh, my point is there there's they're uncovering or they're seeking to draw out or to discover whether or not there's any lack of contentment with the grace of God. And if you are a lover of pleasures more than you are a lover of God, then they're going to be effective at uh, reaching you. In Numbers 15.39, and the latter part of that verse is, is what I'm interested in, it says, and that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye go a whoring. You know, men are generally led astray, uh, James Wright, when they are led, you know, uh, tempted when they, they're drawn away of their own lust. You know, they're not satisfied, they're not content with what God has provided for them. In Deuteronomy 23 and verse 6, and there's a psalm, the whole chapter, Psalms chapter 3. But in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 6, uh, speaking about the wicked, the ungodly, thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days of, all thy days forever. The psalmist over there in Psalm 73 talks about my feet had well nigh slipped. Um, let me, time gets away so fast. <laughs> uh, Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, but not being content with God's grace. Psalms 10 verse 3 talks about the wicked boast of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord at 
abhor. Psalms 10.4 talks about the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You know, when, you, when you're not content with, with God's provisions, then that opens the door. Really, in my, in my mind, it begins to open the floodgates. Jeremiah 45, 5, and seekest thou great things for thyself? He says, seek them not. You, you see, for Paul, for Paul, in Philippians 1, 20, he says, for to me to live is Christ. But also living for others. Now, I think about that as I wrap up here. And when Paul says again, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love. And it's that phrase, and I didn't quite get there yet, but uh, it's in that phrase that I think goes beyond just even having your doctrine right, but believing the right doctrine. Um, and, and, and the benefit that comes from that, but when you talk about holding fast to forms of sound word, it's not just being sound in your doctrine in the sense of just, you know, having the doctrine right, but if you don't, if, if, if you don't believe it, okay, and, and, and if, there's no, if there's no love, if there's no, it, it, you just become puffed up. Paul says, um, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And it's in, in faith and in love. If, if that's not undergirding or if that is not enveloping, your embracing of sound doctrine, uh, it leads to departure because it becomes more about self-interest and self-promotion. Well, let me just say this in closing. You cannot be about your ministry, about being original, being unique, or distinguishing yourself in doctrine or in your message. That is a sure way to departure. Paul said it well when he said it to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, the same, The idea of the form of sound words, that, that, that there, is a, there is a pattern and that there are, I would say, specific doctrines well, just give me just allow me to say this here. In closing, the form speaks of a pattern by which one can maintain the sameness of a thing. And the idea is holding to doctrinal phraseology received of Paul. Now, that, the thing that determines that for us, and that, that's another issue, but the thing that determines that for us is the book, the scriptures. And if you ever wonder why we fight so hard about the book in your hand. That's one of the reasons. Because the doctrines we believe are actually preserved by the translation that we use. And the, the effort to turn you away from the King James is to obscure the doctrine to lead you away from, from the doctrine that, that we received of Paul. 
words are to be retained and used so that the doctrinal statements of the truth remain accurate and the norm for future teachers and preachers. And so that's why the Bible issue is such an important issue for you and I. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word around which we gather to study. We pray, Heavenly Father, we'll receive that word, not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, that works effectually in them that believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.